Hello, everyone. Uh, Dear Eve. Uh, yeah, been gone for a long while again. Um, I had a baby, so <laughs> that's that. Uh, into today's video, I will just point out. I'm actually. I had to use my sister's printer to to print out my notes. Uh, so I just said I'd record here while I can because her house is nicer. Um, but my nephew is actually in the next room playing games. And for any gamers or anybody who has gamer children or no gamers, uh, sometimes they get loud. So I apologise if you can hear any noise. Hopefully you, it should be locked out. Anyway, uh, so today's video isn't a murder. Uh, today's video isn't a murder. It isn't a missing persons, but it is a mystery. It is an unsolved. Uh, so, just to get straight into it, on Tuesday the 16th of June 2009 at 6.30am, the body of a man was found on a beach in Sligo. Assuming that he had drowned, the guardy expected and waited for his family to come forward, but no one did. And so begins the mystery of Peter Bergman. So on Friday the 12th of June 2009, a man in Derry at Derry bus station went over to a bus and asked if they were going to Sligo. That bus however was going to Galway so the driver then directed him to the bay that was going to Sligo and this man was very clear that where he wanted to go was Sligo. <clears throat> I said Sligo about five times there. So uh, the man travelled by bus then to Sligo and he arrived at uh, 6 28 p.m in the evening he then got a taxi and asked uh, the taxi driver to bring him to quote a cheap place to stay he was brought to one hotel first originally and they were fully booked out i think there was like a hens or a stags on uh, so he was then brought to sligo city hotel um, i have read that the bus station is actually quite close to these hotels so it shows that the man wasn't obviously familiar with the area because he would have known it would have just been easier to walk but unless he's lazy like me he would have if you have luggage or anything, you're just going to get a taxi anyway. Anyway, so the man arrives into Sligo City Hotel. Um, he was in his 50s or early 60s, slender, with grey hair, blue eyes. He had a German or Austrian accent, but he spoke uh, good English. He did not have a reservation, obviously, at the hotel. So he booked three nights with breakfast for £65 per night, and he paid cash. He signed the register as Peter Bergman, I'll put it up here, and the address is Einstetern, but there's an S there instead of what I would think should be an A, uh, 15, and then VN 4472, which is obviously Vienna. Uh, so despite the policy at the time being that you're supposed to show photo ID, like it's obviously like that now, it's obviously more stricter now, but I remember even I would have been, I remember actually, I think in around 2009, we went me and some girls went to a hotel for like a spa weekend and we were asked for ID and we paid by card. Now I know hotels, if you're paying cash, like I worked in a hotel uh, last year and if you were paying cash, you would have to um, like give extra money, like a 100 euro deposit. I mean, this was to obviously cover if you mess the place up, if you smoke, anything like that. But um, we were paying by card and we still had to, like they still asked for each of our passports. There was four of us, I think. Um, so that was the policy all over Ireland. That was what was supposed to happen. However, uh, Peter Bergman was not asked to produce ID. Now, we were young when we went, so maybe the fact that he was old, he was an older man on his own in his 50s or 60s, he doesn't seem very like risky as a resident, so maybe they just didn't bother. I don't know. Um, Germans use Spell Bergman with one N, apparently, and Austrians use two, so that's why they leaned towards the Austrian um, nationality. When checking in, he had a black like hold all bag. I think kind of like a bit of like a like a sports bag, a gym bag, and a black shoulder bag. You know that um you might have like use it for, use for a laptop or something. The hotel manager said that uh he would come down every morning for breakfast. He would say hi or like acknowledge the staff. You know he'd nod at them or whatever when he saw them. Um, but generally he kept to himself for the stay. Now, uh, he went in and out a lot from the hotel into the Sligo town during his stay and every time he went out he brought a purple plastic bag just basically like a shopping bag and it was just purple and it would have been full or it, you know you could tell there was contents in it and every time he came back he didn't have the purple bag so it is presumed that he 
emptied the contents or whatever, got rid of the, whatever was in it, and then folded it up or whatever and put it into the jacket pocket. On Saturday, 13th, he went to the post office in Sligo at 10.49 a.m. It is said that he either bought eight or ten, depending on the source, 82 cent stamps. So he bought 82 cent stamps and he bought either the quantity of eight or ten. Um, 82 cent would have been for a stamp outside of Ireland. And he also got some airmail stickers. On the Sunday, he left the hotel and uh, went towards a taxi. And asked the taxi man, like on a map, like a tour, little tourist, um, pointed to Strand Hill and asked him if this was a good beach to swim. So the taxi man said, no, this would be more like a surfing beach. I Like Ross's point would be a good, a good swimming beach. And so the man asked to be brought there. So on the journey, they both sat in the front, which is another thing. Um, it's kind of it's it's kind of said throughout the whole thing that he, you know, very much kept to himself and stuff like that. But I know, like I would never, I never sit in the front of a taxi. I know most of my friends and stuff don't. You just automatically sit in the back, and it's not like a, it's not like a snobbery thing. It's just I think more like it's really awkward to just sit like in close proximity with the taxi driver. I don't know, but he did so for everybody for the whole kind of theory being that he was quite to himself and you know isolating and stuff like that he got in the front of the taxi and talked to the taxi man so anyway um they chatted the taxi man's name was gerald higgins so he said that uh the man told him he was from austria he was very nice he was very pleasant they chatted and um, he said he could tell that he had uh, two gold teeth when they arrived um ross's point has like the first two beaches the first beach the second beach I think it's all really just one long kind of strand with a little bit in between. Um, but anyway, they arrived. He showed him the first bit, the second bit. Uh, Peter Bergman then got out, you know, kind of had a look around and stuff, and then got back in the taxi and asked him to show him where the bus station was. So he did. And then after that, he asked him to bring him back to the hotel. He did. And um, Gerald said that he even said to him, kind of like, if he was planning to go anywhere else, he like, here's my card, you can give me a call or whatever. And so Peter Bergman paid him. 20 pound or 20 pound a 20 euro note and that was that so on the monday uh he asked the reception for a late checkout because he said he had some errands to run and so he this was granted so he left at 106 p.m he had the black hold all bag the black laptop bag and the purple shopping bag so he was seen on camera then at the doorway of quayside shopping center um, shortly after this and he just kind of hung around there for a little while um, not doing much when he's on CCTV at Keyside Shopping Centre he has the three bags then he arrives at the bus station Sligo bus station at either 1.32pm or 1.38pm depending on the sources but from the shopping centre to the bus station on Google Maps anyway it says it's like a six minute walk so he took kind of roughly 15 minutes so what was he doing at that time? Now, when he arrives, he no longer has the black hold all bag. He gets a cappuccino and a sandwich from the co the like coffee shop in the bus station. He sits down. It's, it looks like there's quite um on like a limited number of tables and people are kind of sharing tables. I think he's actually sitting with one or two other people. He sits there. It doesn't look like he interacts with them. He takes out. Uh, I've I've read from again from different sources that he takes out paper and is just like reading it and eventually tears it up. I've read I've heard that he is, takes the pieces out, writes on them, and then is looking at them and eventually tears them up. And I've also read that he, it was an actual little notebook that he took out, wrote on it, and then ripped those pieces of paper up. So the depot manager um of the bus station said that this man arrived up to him, Peter Bergman, and was asking about the different buses to Ross's Point and was asking about the um two forty one. And he he said that he was quite like adamant that this is the one he needed to get. He had to get a 241. He said he seemed very uptight and stressed and stuff like that. And that uh, the depot manager said that he reassured him like if he misses the 241, there's a 3 p.m. one, this type of thing. But that he was very adamant that he needed to get the 240 p.m. one, which he did. So the bus dropped the passengers at Yates Hotel at Ross's Point at 3 p.m. Uh, Peter Bergman did not have a reservation here. And it doesn't seem like he entered the hotel uh, to get food or drink or like use facilities or anything like that. So there would be several sightings of Peter Bergman at Ross's Point that day. Um, I'm just going to read them out just so that I have the times and stuff right. 
So at 4 p.m. he is seen on the beach with the shoulder bag. At 5 p.m. he is seen near the yacht club, which is near the beach. Just after 9 p.m. he is seen by two women on the beach carrying something. So presumably this is either the purple bag or the shoulder bag. Um, I wonder, the purple bag would probably be more noticeable. It would have still been bright out at that time. Um, I would say the purple bag would be quite not like would be noticeable. You would know that that's what the person was carrying. So I would lean towards it being the shoulder bag, and maybe that's why he didn't. But anyway, he was carrying something. So at nine thirty p.m., he was seen by a couple on the beach. He was actually he had his trousers rolled up to his knees. He still had his like black leather jacket on, and he was walking along the water, like the edge of the water, and it was sunset. So they said that he kept. Kind of where the sun was hitting the water, he kept like going back and forth, back and forth at that point. Further sightings at 9.45 and 10.20 p.m. Then at 10.30 p.m. he was seen on the path near the beach and this was with the purple bag and wearing his glasses. That will be important later. 11 p.m. he is seen again with the plastic bag. So a couple say that they went for like dinner or something and then afterwards they went for a walk on the beach. And as they were walking back to leave the beach, they were uh, agreed, but like they met him on his way back down. They said hi, and so he like nodded in acknowledgement. At 11.10 p.m., he was then seen on one of the benches that overlooked the beach, still wearing his glasses. So by this point, it seems like the shoulder bag is gone. Every time we've mentioned it now, it's the purple bag. So again, going back to my other point, presumably earlier, it was probably... No, actually, that would have been the purple plastic bag then. Um... Then it must have been the plastic bag and he obviously had already gotten rid of the shoulder bag by this point. That's what I'd be leaning towards now. The last sighting of Peter Bergman was at 11.50pm. A woman saw him walking along the water still carrying the plastic bag and he was still wearing all his clothes. This is the last sighting of Peter Bergman. And the tide would come in at around 25 past 12, like midnight then. uh, 30 minutes roughly away. So the following day, uh, Tuesday the 16th of June, at 6.30am, a father and son, Arthur and Brian Kinsler, were out training for a triathlon or a marathon or something, when they came across what they thought could have been a mannequin. That's what it looked like to them. But as they got closer, they realised then it was the body of a man lying face down in the sand. Um, They touched him. They touched his leg and he was marble cold. So they obviously alerted the guardie. He was around 30 metres from like the slip that comes down onto the beach. So he was wearing like his his navy underwear, like his his underpants, let's say. Then like striped purple, like speedo type swimming trunks, swimming briefs over them, like over the underpants. And then his navy t-shirt was tucked into them. And when the guardie arrived, they searched and not far away on the rocks, they found his other items, his other possessions. So um, his black leather jacket, the trousers he was wearing and a black v-neck jumper uh, were folded up onto the rocks. His socks were tucked into his shoes and then in his pockets were his watch, 140 euro in notes, 9 euro in coins, uh, some aspirin, like a box of aspirin and a little unopened uh, pack of soap, like a hotel soap and a pack of tissues. Now what have I missed? His glasses, his glasses were not here, his glasses were not on his body, so we would assume at this point that they were washed out to sea. He was pronounced dead at 8am by Dr. Valerie McGowan, and his body was removed at 8.20am. The autopsy was uh, performed the following day on the 17th by Clive Kilgallen. So the man's teeth uh, seemed to be in good condition and showed that there had been dental dental work performed on them and he had two gold teeth. He had only one kidney and his heart weighed 440 grams. Um, I tried to look it up. It seems like that maybe that's like heavy for from what I could. I was getting random kind of for different ages and stuff, men and women. It seems like that's a heavy weight for your heart, but I, I couldn't be 100% sure. Um, there was wasting of muscles around like his hands and stuff, which shows, uh, re- or which, uh, which suggests uh, recent weight loss. And this is kind of the big thing. Uh, Peter Bergman, or the unman known, had advanced prostate cancer that had spread into his bones, um, his lymph nodes and his lung. 
the medical examiner said that he would have been in tremendous pain, but the toxicology reports showed no painkillers in his system. He said that he also had uh, previous heart attacks. The medical examiner also said that he would have only had weeks to live and that he, like, he would have known that he was sick. There was no way that he couldn't have known. Then the other thing, there was no evidence of foul play and there was no evidence of classic saltwater drowning. So as I said earlier, no one came forward to claim the man on the beach. So through some investigating, the Guardian were able to establish that he was uh, a resident at Sligo City Hotel. I'll just point out as well, no businesses in Ross's Point um, remember serving him at all that day, serving him food, drink, again, using the facilities or anything like that. But it just gets stranger from here. So there was no passport in the name of Peter Bergman for anyone matching his description in Ireland, the UK, mainland Europe or the Americas. His DNA and fingerprints were not on record in any jurisdiction. Now, it is said that um, that only means that he, like, they would only show up if he has a criminal record or if he has been arrested before. So that necessarily isn't a clear indicator. CCTV would show the man leaving the hotel with a purple bag 13 times, you know, with it full of contents and returning without it later that day. He is seen all over Sligo Town on camera. Uh, with the purple bag or, or you know later on without it but at no point does any camera catch him putting stuff into a bin or anything like that obviously Gardy at this point were like a few days behind uh, so you know they were kind of chasing their tail a bit I suppose but they searched the bins they searched um gardens they searched bushes they searched car parks secondhand shops dumps everything the public bins that would have been in Sligo Town. So the public bins are basically, obviously, they're not like wheelie bins where like they're just thrown into a dumpster. Um, council workers pull them out in here in Dublin anyway. You literally have to open like the bin and pull out the bag. And so they contacted the bin men and the bin men were all adamant that they never saw like a large bag, like a hold all or anything like that, or like large interesting items in their bins. The clothes that he was wearing and that were beside uh, or that are near his body, all had their labels cut off um, and then some of his items. So his clothes were from C&A, which is a Belgian slash German slash Dutch clothes store, obviously in Europe. His watch was Q&Q, which when I look it up is like India. I don't know if that, like obviously it's just a watch. There's no more kind of indication to it. Whereas obviously the Belgian, German, Dutch thing kind of makes sense. Uh, his leather shoes were from, uh, were made by Finn Comfort. Um, a German company but they weren't able to track them down by kind of any like batches or anything like that the batch number on the aspirin that he had on him again was not able to be tracked down and the tissues were soft and citrus now when I google that it's not even it's not even showing anything up for that it's just trying to sell me tissues and then finally the soap remember the little bar of soap which is like a typical hotel soap it just said on it like mild soap um, and this was in English, but they checked and no hotels in Ireland used this soap like. Uh, but it's just interesting that it's in English. It's in English. So I don't know if that really means anything like because that mean could that mean he got it in like in the UK then uh, or like that. If you go to I'm trying to think of any time I've been away in a hotel away, like in Europe, would their products be in English kind of to suit tourists or would they be like if you go to Austria and you're staying in the hotel? Would it say mild soap in, in Austrian or whatever? Um, I don't really know if that if that matters. He left nothing in the hotel. You know, people sometimes leave things behind. Um, and the hotel manager basically said that on the Saturday of his stay, the cleaning crew or whatever couldn't get into his room. They couldn't gain access. Um, so the hotel manager then went up and opened the room to go in. And she said that when she opened the door, he was basically just standing kind of in just in from the doorway and that he like got startled like surprised when she opened the door but that um she, he she said he like seemed relieved that it was her so she was kind of implying I think like that it could have been that he had, he thought it might have been someone else 
no leads came from Northern Ireland, so like no one came forward to say that they saw him or that they knew him or anything like that. Um, as far as I know, when you're traveling on like a boat tour from the UK, <clears throat> you don't need to show. There's no checks like you don't need to show. Like I'm trying. Like anytime I've been on a boat going over. As far as I know, you never, like, I remember once going over, we were going to Wales, I think. And I remember thinking that, like, like you actually nearly, you, you get off the boat and there's, like, a whole open kind of area before you even go in to, like, the the exit, if that makes sense. And I remember thinking, if you really wanted to, like, if you were evading something, you could just walk off there. You don't actually need to go through the building to leave and to enter Wales. You just go. And um, maybe some places are a bit stricter. But they checked, obviously, there was no leads from this. Gaddy went to the UK and checked the airports over there and stuff. Apparently, they used, like, facial recognition and nothing showed up from there. So, here's another weird one. The address that he gave um, does not exist. It either does not exist or it's a vacant lot. Again, different sources kind of say that. But the majority of things say that it just doesn't exist. Um, the postcode was 4472, I think, for Vienna. And apparently in Vienna, uh, the postcodes only go up to 1901. So, like, it, it just couldn't possibly exist. The investigation lasted five months. It gained traction kind of here and abroad. Um, the Gardaí, you know, searched extensively, like here and again over in the UK. They searched, obviously, with different jurisdictions and stuff like that. But they were no closer to finding out who the man with the purple bag was. The unknown man was then buried in Sligo Cemetery um, in a plot that's owned by the HSE, so like the health service over here. Um, it's kind of sad. So obviously for like unknown people, three go into a plot together. So one after the other, like one on top of the other. So which is just kind of really sad when you think about it. And it's kind of bothers me to think of how many of those plots there is. Um, so someone is underneath him. He was the second going in. And then they decided that they wouldn't put anyone else in after him in case they need to bring him back up for anything. After the Irish Times podcast on this case uh, by Rosita Boland, she said that like she had a lot of um, people come forward, you know, like different kind of people obviously trying to help and stuff like that. I think there was like people doing like facial, facial kind of, um, you know, like when they sketch stuff up and stuff like that. None of these things led anywhere. And then again, after her podcast, uh, German and Austrian newspapers did run with this story to try, you know, ask people to come forward if they knew anything. But again, there was no leads. Like at this stage, I don't really have many theories. I just have so many questions. The main theory obviously is, so the unknown man obviously knew that he was dying and that he decided to come to Ireland to commit suicide. That's what it's basically saying. Um, obviously maybe because he didn't want to do it near, you know, he didn't want to be around loved ones. He maybe didn't want to cause him the stress. Like, I don't know, like cancer is a very horrific thing. So maybe he just didn't want to get to the point where he had to rely on people to look after him. I don't know, you know, maybe he didn't have loved ones to look after him. I don't know. But it's basically kind of the theory is that he came here to, to die on his own terms. And by doing that, he also wanted to get rid of his identity. He didn't want it to be traced back to wherever he was from. Again, maybe to not worry loved ones. Although I would think that leaving, just disappearing, is, is going to worry your loved ones. Um, why Ireland or why Sligo? Sligo is associated with uh, WB Yeats. Um, and so it's kind of said, like, was he a fan of Yeats? Did he like his literature? So did he like the, the idea of Ireland, you know, like this kind of idyllic place? And is that why he came? Or Sligo specifically, uh, the idyllic kind of, you know, view of Sligo and, you know, why not kind of come here? Nearly like a romantic kind of thing about it. The theory is also obviously that he, you know, wanted to drown or, want, you know, whatever to that way and that perhaps his body would then go out to sea and then it wouldn't come back that he didn't expect it to come back in so that he thought he would just never be found this is the main theory obviously people love conspiracy theories and so i guess you could like i mean i don't think i've really seen anything other than that being it but i mean if you want to go with them a lot of the time when things like this happen like with the Taman should case the summerton man and um Oh, the girl in Oslo, you know, the lady in Oslo who killed herself in the room. Or like some people say she didn't kill herself. 
with them, don't they kind of so they try to say like that they were spies or this or, the, or this or that or whatever. Um, nothing like that has ever been really associated with Peter Bergman. But yeah, so I don't really have a lot of theories myself. Sometimes I like to think, oh, what if this and what if that. But my thing is more so I just have so many questions, and I'm sure you, if you know this case or if you've just heard it, heard it, heard it now, you would have loads of questions. But I'm just going to go through my questions. Maybe it'll spark something. Or maybe you will have an answer to that that you can share with me. Like I said before, I like hearing things back and stuff. It, it helps. So in no particular order, I'm just going to go through them. So his blue shirt. So when he left the hotel, he obviously had his trousers and his jumper and stuff like that and his jacket. But he had a blue shirt under the jumper. This was not found on his body, obviously. And it was not found um, in the clothes. So where did it go? And like, wh where did it go? How did he get rid of it? And why get rid of it? If you left all your other clothes there, why not just cut the tag off that and leave that there as well? So obviously, I don't know why you'd get rid of it. And then also, where did you get rid of it? Again, no one, no one sees it getting rid of. Medical examiner said that he was in um like a lot of pain that he would it would like it, like say that it would have hurt to walk kind of thing. Um, so why have aspirin in your like pocket? I don't know how much how how strong aspirin would be in terms of pain from cancer but like why not take them if you have them on you like why have them on you then so the glasses so before I say the next thing I don't really want to um I don't really want to be too like skeptical is probably not the right word but I don't really want to be like criticizing questions around a suicide because obviously unless you've done that or you've tried to do that no one knows what's in your head of how you would act beforehand people obviously question sometimes why someone would do something you know, before they kill themselves. And I think especially with mysteries, people like to think, well, you know, you wouldn't do X and like if you were going to kill yourself. So like they must not have been killed. They must have been murdered or whatever. But I don't really want to, because I can't imagine how someone's mind thinks before deciding to do that. So I, I'm not really going to, and that's not what I'm doing here, but I'm just asking, where are his glasses? He is seen right up until the end with his glasses on and then they're not there. So if we were to assume that he went into the water, did he leave them on? But like then, what would you take your watch off? Like if you if you don't care about the things getting damaged or, or whatever, maybe the watch had more sentimental value. Maybe he was really like he looked like could not see it all and needed the glasses on. I don't know. Where is the purple plastic bag? So basically, at the last sighting at eleven fifty p.m., he still has it, and then that person leaves, and then he's already um undressed by the time the tie comes in. So he had to have undress himself in that time and then did he also leave the beach once more get rid of the plastic bag somewhere and then and then come back out and then also the blue shirt I don't know I'm guessing he still had the blue shirt on if he was fully dressed at this uh, uh, in all these sightings so again did he leave the beach to get rid of the purple or the purple the blue shirt and come back like why why go through all that bother I just I, like it's a lot you know and like if the purple bag was empty at this stage, I don't know if it was, but if it was empty at this stage, why not just leave it there? What's it matter now at this stage? I can't imagine you're going to be traced back because of a purple bag. And if you were, I'm sure images of the purple bag would have traced you back at this stage. So it's obviously not specific to somewhere. Again, not trying to criticize someone's thought process, but why why would you remove your clothes? Like if the if the idea is that he was just gonna go in to kill himself to drown or whatever. Would you take your clothes off? I don't really know. And then like that, why would you bring swimming tags? Because through all the through all the times he has been seen, he was never swimming. He was never going into the water, coming out of the water. He always just had like like the time that he just had his uh, trousers rolled up to his knees. So like, why would you have? Why would you bring swimming trunks if your if your idea your plan was never to actually swim? Uh, sorry, I made a boo boo. So this will go in somewhere at one point. Um, so they said that he did not drown. You know, there's no signs signs of drowning or whatever, right? Which is what we would have assumed happened if he was going to kill himself. Yeah, um, I can't find or remember the source that said it was a heart attack. Um, so I don't know if it was actually a heart attack or that's what they're just alluding to. But then the question there was kind of like, like, did he never intend to kill himself? Was he really just swimming and had a heart attack, or like, what are the chances of you going to do that and kill yourself? And then having a heart attack anyway. So that kind of adds more questions. You know, like, could you know 
that you're you're so bad like it, you know the cancer is so bad you're so weak all of this stuff you know by the cold like Irish water is cold at the best of times could you have thought that that was what was going to happen that you would have a heart attack or you thought something would happen and then that is how it happened maybe I don't know it's just another it's just another question on top of all the other questions really isn't it um in the bus station the depot manager said that he was quite stressed and like uptight about you know getting that bus but he was found 140 euro in cash so like if you were that stressed about getting there on time or just getting there kind of as quick as you can why not just take another taxi like you had the money to do it so like at that point is it that you just don't want any more interaction with people i don't know so the stamps the letters or parcels or whatever so um obviously people are saying that like that's eight or ten letters then that he sent out now the post office had um cctv outside where like the post boxes were and they were they were given the guardy were given the footage on like a usb stick to see if he had you know um posted letters or posted parcels or what because obviously he could have used several stamps to just post one parcel you know what i mean it didn't necessarily have to be specifically individual letters but when they for whatever reason a human error or a glitch or something when they tried to look at the footage on the usb it was deleted and by the time they went back to the post office to ask for it again they had deleted it so the footage if he has posted stuff is gone but why buy the stamps if you weren't gonna send something so people obviously think that he was writing you know to loved ones or whatever again was he writing to loved ones like if it was a case, right, that he was writing or that he, you know, just thought by disappearing, maybe if he thought by disappearing, he could just send them like one last letter of, you know, the things he wanted to say and, you know, something in a way nearly that they could, it's something they can keep that tells them, you know, that has him saying that he loves them or, you know, advice that he wants them to have for the future or anything like that. Like he's not from a, he's not from a mad, isolated country. So the letters... The letters have uh, stamps on them, like postmarks, you know, the, from the franking that would say Ireland on them. So if they got one, right, and it said Ireland on them, they could easily then, like Austria or Germany or whatever, isn't that far away. You could easily try find out if he was here. And once you find out, like once you made contact with Ireland, it was huge news. So, you know, you would know from the pictures and stuff that that's your dad or whatever, your, you know, your husband or your brother or whoever. Sorry, just I will just say actually maybe should have said it earlier. Um, in terms of pictures, if you Google Peter Bergman, the first picture that will come up is um the autopsy photo. I don't know, I don't really know why they have that photo on Wikipedia, but it's the first one that comes up. It's it's him obviously in in the medical examiner's room or whatever. So just be forewarned because like it's it can be a lot. I remember I'd actually done that once. Um, obviously I was surprised when I saw it for Peter Bergman, but there's another guy. Um. Lyle Stevick again if you're going to decide to google him I, I googled him after watching Lord and Art's episode on him and the he again he he committed suicide in a hotel and he was unknown for a very long time and he uh his picture the, the pictures that will show up are the actual pictures of him in the hotel after committing suicide and those images did not leave me for a very long time uh so be forewarned searching Peter Bergman or Lyle Stevick um anyway for the post anyway theory that i had this is my only theory i guess uh for posting right what if he wasn't posting letters maybe he didn't have loved ones or whatever right what if he wasn't posting letters uh to people what if he was just getting rid of like like his important kind of identifying things like his passport any other like kind of you know like documents that you might have because the laptop bag no one uh no one said that they saw him with a laptop now, I mean, he could have had it in his room, but, you know, sometimes you'd sit in the lobby or whatever if you were getting a drink or a coffee or a pint or whatever, and you'd sit there and maybe do stuff. Um, no one saw him do that. So maybe the laptop bag, or the shoulder bag wasn't a laptop bag. Maybe like that could have had forms or important kind of documents and stuff like that. So, like his passport and stuff. So maybe, like, because to be honest, if I was going to try and get rid of my ID and stuff like that, I'd just do that. I'd just post stuff to, like, random addresses in the world because like they can't come back right because unless you put a an address on it like if you if i'm in ireland and i just put like one 
German street in France, right, or whatever. When it goes there, even though it says it came from Ireland, like, they're not going to know where in Ireland. They're not going to, like, they can trace it back from the franking or whatever. They can trace it back to the post office, the post depot or whatever. But they can't then say, like, oh, well, we can find out who it's from. Do you know what I mean? So I don't think they'd bother sending it back or anything. So, like, that, if my ID just went to somewhere random in France, they're just going to have my ID when they find it. They just throw it out. I don't know. Maybe that's a silly thing to think. But anyway. But an interesting thing I I do think is, what if the staff member in the hotel had done their job and asked for ID? What would he have done? Like, he couldn't have relied on them. No, Like, he couldn't have known that they wouldn't ask for ID. So then would he say he didn't have ID? Would he give them his real passport? Would his plan then be ruined? The thing is, if he did have loved ones, surely by now they'd have come forward. Like, in this age of technology and stuff, and, you know, if he had sent them letters or parcels or something, right? Even besides that, just would you not have come forward by now, right? And if he didn't have any loved ones or anything, right? Why all the sneaking around? Why why would it matter? If if the point is kind of like you don't want your loved ones to find out what happened to you kind of thing. If you don't have those loved ones, what's it matter like? Why do all this sneaky stuff? This case has been referred to as like the, the Irish Somerton case or whatever. Um, or the Irish Tam and Shud. Um, to me, it's kind of sadder. And maybe part of that is because, you know, that one was from a long time ago and this one is so much more recent. Or maybe because it's from Ireland. But I think it's because, like, the Somerton man and the woman at the hotel and stuff, they were just, they were just bodies after the death, if that makes sense. But we've seen, we seen Peter. We saw him. You see him moving around the hotel room in the, vid, in the you know, images and the videos. You see him moving around. You see him out having a smoke. You know, you see him walking around the town with his little purple bag and stuff. You know, there's, there's, it's a person. I know, I don't know if that really makes sense. And I can picture him, like, alone on the beach in the dark. And then, just because it's newer, like, like that, there's so much CCTV and stuff in Sligo. Um, you know, even with just technology and everything else, even like that communication between countries is obviously a lot more substantial now how is it not solved like how have they not identified this person it's like when I go back to the whole thing with missing people I don't understand how someone in this day and age can just go missing when there's so much CCTV like how you can just vanish turning around a corner and that's it you just vanish I just don't get it so I don't know but I still hold out hope that he will be identified that something will happen there will be a breakthrough um whether that's eventually through DNA of some sort or someone eventually does come forward but I do hold a hope. Like I said, the other case, Lyle Stavik, he was unknown for a very long time. That was an alias that he used in the hotel. And eventually his um, family were notified. They were able to identify his family were notified of his death. So there's always hope. So that is the case of Peter Bergman, the Irish Somerton man, the man with the purple bag. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything. If I did, please let me know. This is one that's kind of always interests me. As you know, I love the mysteries. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting oh, it's an interesting one. If you have theories or you know the answer to any of the questions that I've kind of asked, let me know. Let me know what you think. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I've been MIA again for a while. I always have excuses, don't I? But um, yeah, no, I, I made a human so. <laughs> I could come back straight away. Um, if you have any that you want, you can comment below or email me or whatever like that. And yeah, so I hope you're all keeping well. Hope you're keeping safe. Hopefully we're near the tail end of the pandemic and we will go back to some sort of good times. Um, yeah, but until then, anyway, please take care and stay safe. Thanks for watching. Bye.